Again, welcome to today's panel for Careers in the Creative Economy. Again, my name is Rachel Christensen. Thank you all for joining. I have a wonderful panel with us today. I'm so excited for all of you to hear them um, and their journeys. And I will go ahead and have them introduce themselves. It's going to be a little bit around my own screen. So um, if you see something different than I do, I'm sorry. But um, I'm going to go ahead and start with David. If you could introduce yourself and what your current role is. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, so my name is David Conley. I graduated from UCI in 2014 as a computer game science major and have since pivoted into my career now, which is I work here at UCI actually in the division of continuing education, but I do um, animation and graphic design for them. So things like motion graphics, educational videos, explainers, those type of things are primarily my focus. And so uh, in addition to that, I have work on the side that I do as well for freelance as I'm sure most of the people on this panel do. And we can get into that later, but that's a, a summary of who I am and where I'm coming from. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And Gabby? Hey, I'm Gabby Lucas. I um, graduated in 2012 with an MFA in dance. Um, currently am a content marketing manager for AMS, which is an employer brand um, recruitment marketing agency. So I help market, market and advertise jobs and let people know about the brand as an employer versus a in the consumer world. Thank you for joining. Joe? Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Joanna Myers Holm. I graduated from UC Irvine in 2006, um, and I am currently the sales and marketing manager for Alusa Winery, which is in Napa Valley. Um, but lots, lots of creative elements there that I can thank, uh, the Claire Trevor School of the Arts for. So, yeah. Thank you so much. And last but not, definitely not least, Patrick. Hi, everyone. My name is Patrick Burns, and I... I work as a, a music director, a playwright, a composer, an actor, a producer, and a creative connector. So I do, a, I do lots of different things. And I graduated from the Claire Trevor School of the Arts in 2009 with a bachelor's in drama. Thank you all for joining today's panel. I am so excited to hear your career journeys. Um, so I'm gonna start off with the first question, um, which is, you all have interesting career paths, but what has led you to this career path and your current position? Was it a straight road or did it, you know, curve a little bit? And I'll go ahead and start with David. Uh, so the short answer to that question is it curved a lot. Um, as, as I referenced early in my introduction, right, I graduated from UC Irvine with a computer game science major which I chose because it was a new major at the time and I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And I liked video games and computer game sciences seemed to get me the closest. Um, while I was in undergrad, I did a lot of student affairs related work. And so I was a spot staffer for a while, right? I did a RA my fourth year. And so those experiences I chose instead of doing things in the computer science field, like internships and things like that, because I don't know, I just enjoyed it more. and. When I got out of college, of course, there wasn't really anything waiting for me in terms of a computer science job because I just didn't have experience aside from my degree, right? And so instead I chose to do what I liked doing and what I had experience with was, was more student affairs. And my first job out of college in 2015 was at UCI's summer session department. I worked with the Freshman Edge Early Start Program. And I was there for a little bit of time, but what was interesting is that around six months into my job there, our marketing manager, who I still love to death and we talk to uh, relatively often, she went on maternity leave um, with, I believe, her second child at that time, right? And all of a sudden, there was a bunch of creative opportunities for me in the department that I would not have gotten otherwise. And I was lucky that I had just been doing creative work as a hobby for a long time, right? I taught myself Photoshop since early high school, right? I was just getting into Illustrator at that time. And I was it basically was like, I can do this work if you want me to. And 
thankfully the leadership on in our department allowed me to kind of experiment and have some fun really with some of our marketing projects and again fortunately enough like they liked it enough for me to keep on doing those projects even after the marketing manager got back like i was able to help um, with the summer session website for example i did a lot of their video content and back in the 2015 to 2018 range right and had a lot of fun gained a lot of experience and then when the time came for me to jump over to continuing education um, for a different project i brought a lot of those skill sets over with me and eventually that got I got kind of got pillaged in a way by a brand new team within continuing education that was focused on course design and making high quality online course content. And that's what I work on now. Um, and really a, a hallmark of my experience, which again is very lucky and very privileged, but I had the ability to kind of learn on the fly, learn on the job, because I had skill sets a little bit coming in, but to be able to create these things and just be encouraged to fail and in, in, in learn as I went along was really, really helpful for me. Um, and that's kind of led me to this career that I have now. Um, on the side, I'm, I'm going to go for a little longer, sorry, on the side of all no, this in, go in ahead, parallel. Go ahead. <laughs> in parallel with this, as I started getting better with design work through my job, I just created work for myself for fun on the side. And a big part of my life now is actually selling my personal artwork on places like Etsy, at comic conventions, et cetera. And so I'm very active in those circuits as well. Um, and I'm sure, like I mentioned, we could talk about that a little more later, but those are the two parallel creative sides of my life that are running right now. And to have come from not knowing what I wanted to do as an undecided and declared student, right? Um, gosh, was that 13 years ago, right? To where I am now, you could not have paid me enough money to live into the future to see where I would have been, right? It just, it seems impossible. Yet here we are. And no, I'm not designing NFTs. Gabby, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I've looked into it, but that is just something outside my wheelhouse. Um, so we'll see. But thanks. Thanks for letting me share. I hope that provided some value. Thank you so much. And I, I love what you said about um, you were given opportunities to fail. And I think a lot of times in the creative field, it it's not always a slam dunk. You, you have to kind of pivot through and it's okay to fail. And if you have the right team by you and supporting you, it's okay. And so um, thank you for that. Gabby, can you talk a little bit about that career path, especially since you came from dance? <laughs> yeah, I am a bit of a ping pong and I continue to be in my career. Um, I um, came to UCI to uh, do graduate school um, in dance and that was after dancing professionally in a ballet company um, with Nevada Ballet actually in Las Vegas and getting to partner with Cirque du Soleil and I wanted to go to grad school to pursue becoming a professor of dance that was kind of the I thought I was pretty linear in thinking of like exactly knew, knowing what I want to do how much time it would take to get there like the whole gambit and that just went out the window when I started grad school. Um, grad school is really hard, <laughs> but it was amazing. I love the experience at UCI. Um, I'm still best friends with the majority of my class. We were a small class of like eight. And um, while I was there, though, while I was doing my thesis, I was um, doing it on Facebook. So. I guess I was the first kind of student to study social media and dance and put those two together. Um, so I performed my thesis on Facebook. And now that's so normal. There's TikTok and it's not that strange, but trust me, at the time it was really awkward and um, kind of kind of just weird. And so because of that, you know, all my professors, they all have their other nonprofit organizations or things outside of UCI that they're doing. They were like, Gabby, you know, social media, can you just run my Facebook channel, my Instagram and all that stuff? And I was like, okay, I had zero training, um, education and marketing. Okay. So I just kind of organically, um, started a business of, um, when I left grad school, I did get to continue performing as a dancer. I moved to LA after um, graduating 
very involved in the art community there, dance, uh, danced in professional companies, and then also taught dance. And then I immediately got to be a professor um, at Cal State Channel Island. So it was great to use my degree directly and made me feel good. But I started getting clients through LA and the art community from dancers, from people who did had their own fitness businesses and all kinds of things. And so I had my own business and then I started um, looking into getting a full-time gig where my first full-time job in um, social media marketing was with a company called Dance On, where this was back when YouTube did MCNs, so multi-channel networks. Um, so we could, back then we could monetize on YouTube so much easier than it is now, but um, it really was great to um, to tie dancers with big YouTube followings with major brands um, and do camp basically what we call now influencer campaigns. And um, yeah, and then from there, I was like, well, I want to work with uh, other bigger budgets. And <laughs> so I moved to agencies in the consumer world. So working with luxury brands. I hopped around until I found this thing called employer branding, which I never had heard of before. But if you think about it, every website in the bottom right hand corner has a tab that says careers. And so um, so really looking at the brand as an employer, what does that mean? So I started in the social media marketing teams and that grew into content marketing, which is my love. I love um, take, taking like the foundation of who, what a brand is and bringing it to life through the people. So I still use my dance training and background um, a lot. And especially when it comes to promoting talent. So I love doing that. Um, and that's where I'm at now. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, that is definitely not a straight road, <laughs> but um, it is amazing to see that those connections as um, you went through that. So thank you. Joanna? Hello. Hi, guys. Yes, definitely a squirrely, whirly, squiggly career path line for me. Um, I double majored in art history in the School of Humanities and Studio Art at the Claire Trevor School of the Arts. Uh, my first job out of um, after graduating was actually a consultant for my sorority. Um, so that was um, a lot of experience, not a lot of artsy, fartsy stuff. But um, once I settled down, I did have a lot of office jobs, but I was always pursuing something creative on the side, even though it wasn't necessarily visual arts. Um, I lived in Chicago for five years and took uh, classes at Second City, um, and I did sketch comedy, and um, through producing all of those shows we did, there was always an element of um, set design and stage design and graphic design to market all of those shows. So my my art degree came in handy there. In 2006, the digital art, um, it, at that point, it was a minor and it was super. Oh, no, you got muted. I was trying, I, hi, I was trying to be cool and hold down the space bar. Um, so in 2006, um, they were just introducing the digital art major. So I, I'm turning 40 this year. I should have worn my 1983 sweatshirt. Um, and woo -woo, uh, the, the Photoshop classes were super impacted. And um, I ended up teaching myself um, the Adobe Creative Suite. And, you know, now we have Canva and we don't have to worry about that. But um, all of those elements of design and art theory and color theory that I learned as being an art major in Claire Trevor School of the Arts was were were and continue to be so instrumental in my day-to-day -day, um, creative career. Um, so no matter what I was doing, I, I always had a creative side hustle. Um, the one that really kind of got me into full-time um, event planning and sales, which is where I am now, uh, I did chalk art. So 10 years ago, 
you know, the DIY wedding was super hot and I was doing um, lettering and illustrations uh, for all kind of um, events, um, corporate events, weddings, stuff like that. And I was able to use that art degree and put it to use. And um, it was a side hustle. I was working at, for all you NorCal folks, I was working for Sutter Health at the time in their IT department. And this is my side hustle and it uh, fulfilled me and made things feel great. But now I am the sales and marketing manager for um, a small winery in Calistoga, California, which is at the north end of Napa Valley. And I use a lot of the the theory and principles of design in um, graphic design, packaging design, event design every day. Um, I also double majored in art history. So um, a lot of critiques, criticisms, uh, writing, all those kind of things you put to use in humanities. I'm in the wine world, even that even that language requirements coming into use these days. Uh, I, I get to drop my French accent every once in a while. Um, but I've always had a graphic design side hustle that really started through my studio art major. And that's what how I ended up doing a creative career full time. Thank you, Joanna. Yeah. And wow, I, I'm seeing a pattern here of um, people learning on their own a lot of the skill sets they want to continue and that eventually developed into something. Um, so let's hear from Patrick. Let's see uh, his background. And you have an interesting background and even where you are right now. Uh, yeah, thanks for your patience. I have this great Zoom set up at home with like lights and a nice camera and I'm on break at a rehearsal for a show that's opening tomorrow, which is why I was probably making you all sick with my like Matthew Bourne shaky cam. Um, but yeah, I am not going to deviate from the pattern that you've heard here. I, I came to UCI as a theater major and I really just wanted to be an actor and I was really interested in acting and singing and performing. And by the time I left UCI, I had done a quadruple emphasis in the drama major. So I had done musical theater performance, acting, music direction, directing, and I was also on the improv team. And I had a lot of professors tell me like, you should really pick your focus and like stick to one thing. And I was sort of like, I think that's stupid because I think that being a good musician makes me a better actor and being a better actor makes me a better person and all these things, you know, so, um, after school, I started working, I moved to LA and I started working as an actor and I started working as a pit pianist. Um, I started playing the piano in high school. And so most people who play the piano professionally start when they're like two. So um, when I was at UC, I actually had a work study job and it was playing the piano. And so through that, I met um, Dennis Castellano, who used to be the head of the musical theater department, who started taking me out to jobs at South Coast Rep and other theaters in LA as his assistant. Um, which was how I learned to play the piano and to conduct orchestras. And so when I was pursuing my acting talents, I always was able to have a job somewhere playing the piano or conducting an orchestra. And so that was a really great way to meet people and get into rooms that actors don't get to get into. I also, um, in my super senior year at UCI, I wrote a musical about my life because I grew up in foster care in Oakland. And so I wrote this kind of emotional but funny like show and by the time I was graduating at theater in LA I wanted to produce it and so then it got produced off Broadway and I got to do it all over the country and I was able to raise money for foster youth while building awareness and also while meeting people and learning how to produce my own material so I had written the show and I wrote the lyrics and the music and the book and I wrote the orchestrations I was hiring the musicians and so through all of that, I ended up, um, I did a national tour of a Broadway show for two years as the associate conductor. And I was doing work as a composer during the day while we were on break from the show because we performed at night. And so through that, I ended up being the resident musical director and composer at a theater in upstate New York for three years, which um, eventually led me back to Sacramento where I got a job with Broadway Sacramento as a producer. And while in that position, I was still traveling out for other gigs doing some commercials, doing some acting, and also doing some arranging and composing for some film and TV projects, which has, you know, been just kind of a fun, you know, hodgepodge of work. And I'm, like I said, I'm at rehearsal today. I'm opening Sound of Music tomorrow. I'm playing the piano and conducting that here. So I'm just, I'm like, like everyone else on here, it's like learning on the way and then 
picking up other jobs. And like, like um, Joe was saying about, about graphic design, I, when you're working on your own shows, you often have to do your own marketing. And so doing my own marketing for my own show off Broadway got me hired by other production companies to do their marketing campaigns for their off Broadway productions. And so I really, I really believe, especially when you're a creative person, creativity is about problem solving and about connections and creative brains make connections to solve problems that a lot of other people don't make. And so it's kind of cool to just kind of like go with the flow and learn a lot and let that, let the, let the skill here influence the skill over there. Thank you so much. You are my people. Um, so uh, you all talk about skills and it's very apparent that you all hold a lot of different skills as the students are on this, um, you know, on this recording call, and those are going to be watching later. What are some advice you would give them regarding gaining skills while they're in college? And so again, gaining skills while they're in college or their master's program while they're still, you know, early in their career, what are things that you would advise them to do? And I'm going to go ahead and start with Gabby for this one. Um, for me, collaboration is super important um, in school and especially when I was in the graduate program, like I said, there was a small group of us and we were all completely different studying completely different things, all in dance, of course, but our backgrounds and our, we're just quite diverse, which was a, our strength and really getting to work with one another uh, ask for feedback, um, be critical. Um, how do we make it better? Um, what are we angry about and what do we do about it? Um, Cause we really wanted to bring change and really wanted to do something different or especially as an artist, right? It's like finding your artistic identity. It's like a huge, hard, big deal and in order to do that you kind of have to really dig in but also be, be have your community around you what I found in my thesis because it was online it was about me it was very DIY think my space selfie mirror picture like really kind of overindulgent in a way and, and I, I did it all online and I found like I was really hungry for people to connect with me online and comment online and like me online, but they were telling me more so in person on campus, like, Gabby, I saw your video and I liked it. And I'm like, why don't you post it then, you know, but I was understanding that, oh, it's about the community. <laughs> And, and yes, being online is amazing. Like I work remotely for the last seven years and I would not change that for the world, but I still need that connection and collaboration with others to this day. And that's been the most fruitful trend, regardless of how much I bounce around jobs or, or um, the country <laughs> even moving um, to me, yeah. Thank you. I heard a lot about collaboration and connection. So um, for all you students, continue to collaborate and to connect with, you know, your fellow classmates, get it, get into those um, student orgs and clubs and classes and really get to know the people that you're surrounded by these last four years or in the next four years. Um, Joanna, can you? Talk a little bit about advice for gaining those skills or what kind of skills they should have. Yeah, absolutely. So skill hard skills are important. I you today alone, I opened Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, and Adobe InDesign, stuff I had to send off. Um, but it was my soft skills that have gotten me this far. And those soft skills were were honed by the student organizations that I was a part of. Um, I think I, I was a campus rep. I was a tour guide. That was huge for me, meeting 
of fellow anteaters from across campus. Um, you know, all my bio sci majors, all my poli sci majors. Um, it was great. I was, I think I was one of like three art majors at the time um, representing Claire Trevor. So that was super important. But, you know, being a part of whether it's SPOP or I, I feel like I'm dating myself because I don't know if these orgs are still around. They're still um, around. They're still around. <laughs> yeah. Um, so also I worked on campus in the housing department as part of the stayover program coordinator. Um, I was learning all these kind of like what we're going to call hard skills. You know, I was learning about Photoshop and composition and um, I was the last I was the last graduating class in school, the Claire Trevor School of the Arts that had the wet lab for photography. So we were like developing film photography. Um, yeah, so date myself right there. Um, but it was those student organizations where I learned, you know, and um, in my fifth year, I also took a victory lap. Um, I was part of a club, yeah, uh, in art history that we did the Art History Student Association. There wasn't before, and I, I started that with a couple other undergrads. And just the, the opportunity that gave me to interact with professors and staff, that was huge. Um, so those student organizations, those kind of like extracurriculars, those are what are going to give you the soft skills that are really going to set you apart. They might not, you know, on a resume, it's really hard or a CV that's really hard to present. But when you're interviewing, when you're talking to people and, you know, like Gabby was talking about putting all the social media content out, that's when people are going to really see how personable you are, how you can communicate your goals, um, how you can gather a team and kind of really motivate them. But um, yeah, a lot of the arts are very um, isolating. Um, when I was, you know, working on my studio art projects, I just wanted to be alone. It was all about me. It was all about the art. But at the end of the day, I had to bring it to class and open it up to critique in front of 20 other, other students. And being able to have that dialogue and really being able to communicate um, has been huge. So there's so many amazing opportunities to get involved on campus at Irvine. Um, I would really, really encourage you guys to do that just to practice um, networking, socializing, public speaking, those are all things that no matter what career path you go to are a valuable skill to have. And if you can do that along with your amazing eye, your dance skills, um, your musical theater aptitude, you're just going to be unstoppable. So dig into those extracurriculars because I have UC Irvine extra crooks to think just as much as the academic part for my career trajectory. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, it's true. A, a lot of the extracurriculars really do um, build the other side of the academics and those soft skills. Patrick? Um, yeah, I mean, I really got a lot from my extracurriculars as well. And li like, um, like Joanna was just saying, you you can be the best artist in the world, but if you can't talk to somebody somebody about your art, you're never gonna you're never gonna sell it. You're never gonna put it in front of somebody. You can be the best violin player in the world, but that does not make you a good orchestra member. Um, and I think um, it's really important when you're building new skills. That was the question, right? Um, something that I do to check in with myself is if I'm doing something that I've never done before ever, and I feel in like super confident about it, I probably don't understand how complex it is. And if I'm doing something I've never done before, and I feel like really afraid and insecure, I'm probably overthinking it. So it's about like checking in with that balance because like super, like super, like stupid people who just do things without intention, they don't ever feel insecure. <laughs> and people who like, so the, I, I just like to strike that balance with myself. Um, and then as a hiring manager, you know, as a producer, you hire tons of people. And every time that somebody's come into an, like an interview and they don't have any humility or they don't seem to say, you know, like, oh, I'm really great at this, but I'm trying to build this skill. I'm like, well, that's kind of a red flag because I don't trust that you know where you are. You really understand what the scope of the project is. Um, and then once again, with the extracurriculars, I would say nine times out of 10, when I get a job, it's because I knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody. So like your skills are really important, but your network is even more important. 
and being present and genuine and kind to people and um, just intentional. Like someone, someone said like, shout out for intention. Like, so I think, I think about this every single day because I think most people just do things without wondering what their intention is, what is their goal. And I, I think it's really, really important, especially with skill building, because you never know where that will take you, but you have to figure out like, is this a valuable use of my energy? Because energy is a finite resource and your brain power is a finite resource. And so you have to really be intentional about how you spend your time and your energy. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Yeah, intentionality. Um, definitely, I saw someone put that on the chat. David, do you want to follow that up? <laughs> Yeah, you, you made me go last for this one, which is great. Um, I'm going to, so I think the common theme that we keep on hearing from all these panelists that I've noticed is um, even when talking about hard skill development, we always venture into the mindset and the, just the, the general soft, you know, how, how you train your brain to, to work even when you don't want to. And I think that's something I wanted to bring up. And I was thinking this when you all were introducing yourselves, right? Like, I think if I were to have been in the student's position, you know, for me, I would have been overwhelmed by all of your successes, right? Which is kind of crazy because I, I had no idea what I wanted to do, really, even in my fourth year of college. I, I didn't really foresee myself doing a creative career, right? And so I think coming to a panel like this would have been overwhelming, but that's because I didn't know how much time helps, right? And it, it's, it's almost sounds like a cop-out answer because I think as creatives, we want answers to be like, oh, how do you get better at this? How do you get better at that? Like, what are the ABCs of getting a job? And I don't have any of that for you, unfortunately. All I can tell you is that I've tried pretty much every day to become a better artist and do something arts-related. Um, every day is a stretch, right? But consistently tried to become better as an artist. And over a long period of time, the uh, jump in skill sets that I've gotten has been substantial, right? But what's that saying? I think that people overestimate what they can do in a day, but underestimate what they can do in a year, right? I think what you're seeing with all these panelists is an extreme case of that, right? Where folks who have been in their careers for X amount of years, right? And they've gotten, lots of them have gotten incredible amounts of success, but that's just because they stuck with it. They were consistent, they worked at it, right? And so to circle back to the original question that you're asking, Rachel, I think in college, even if you don't, focus a ton on developing skills, as long as at some point you pick yourself up and say, hey, like Patrick was saying about intention, like, hey, I want to get better at this, or hey, I want to do this, and just establish some sort of, I guess, habit in doing that on a regular basis, and whether or not it looks good or looks bad, or however metric of success you want to measure it by, right, like, um, that you just keep going, just keep going, just keep going, and it's, it's the worst advice, I hated this advice, I still hate it, but it's true, right, you just have to keep going and um nothing else will make you better except by doing it and that's the only thing i can really recommend in terms of skill development no matter what that skill is is just keep working at it and keep working at it and i promise you you'll get through and have a breakthrough even if you don't think you will it will probably come later than you think but it will come so keep at it thank you david Actually, you reminded me, one of your coworkers reminded me of that um, I just started doing Procreate um, and drawing on Procreate. And he was like, Rachel, if you want to get better at this, set aside five to 10 minutes every day and just keep doing it. <clears throat> and I was like, what? And he's like, you just have to practice. The more you practice, the better you'll get. And so thank you, David, for that. And it comes with a lot of what you all said, the intentionality behind it, the um, the interaction, being able to interact with other people that you just don't hide and, you know, create something and then just hide it in the background. No one ever gets to see it. Um, really, creatives want to show their work. Um, but that is also a scary thing. So how do you get over that fear? And this is based off a lot of those things that you were all talking about. So it wasn't one of the questions I had, sorry. But how do you get over that fear of showing something that maybe you've been working on? And that transition between, hey, I made this to, hey, I'm showing this to a bigger public. And I'm going to start with you, Joanna. How, I mean, you do this a lot, I'm guessing with marketing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and I just, 
want to add to what you know you and David were saying. Um, I was a fine art major. My focus was painting. I don't paint every day, but those principles and artistic kind of ideation, you know, that is informs a fifty percent of my work that I do every day. Even though I'm not literally painting, I'm not a museum curator, um, but those lessons that I learned um, as an undergraduate inform me every day. Um, I, uh, yeah, it's kind of, I'm, I put things out there all the time. So things that I design are on our website, on our brochures. Um, they are kind of out there in our event designs. You just have to, you just have to let it out into the universe and let it, let it be. Um, I think having a team around you that is really good. You know, I started, I was really, I started really getting into art in high school and a big part of that, like I remember taking AP art in senior year of high school and we had critiques and I didn't know any of my other friends who put up, you know, you're an AP French, you're an AP math. You don't put your test up and have your your classmates say, I don't really like how you did X, Y, and Z. I think this could be better. That's not going to happen anywhere else except the arts. You guys are so unique that you are getting this constant stream of feedback. And what you do with it is your decision as an artist. Um, but it has made me such a good employee and teammate, how I know how to take that feedback and incorporate it intentionally, going back to um, Gabby's um, intention, um, incorporate that intentionally or, um, oh, I think my toddler's home, sorry guys, um, um, or in a creative way, but I think as artists, we're really at an advantage that we um, are performing in front of audiences. We're putting our work out there for people. And a lot of other people don't get that. Um, as a professional, that is huge um, because so much of, of it is in... Hi, buddy. Hi. Hi. That's my kid. Um, hi. Um, yes. To improve, you need that feedback. And as artists, we're already used to getting it. Um, so I think that's really important and it's a great skill set that we hone um, and we're lucky to have it. Hi. Hi. Okay. Hi, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. I appreciate that. Um, Patrick, you probably have very similar words and in a similar and different field all at the same time. So <laughs> any advice on how to get over that? Well, fear. Yeah. You just have to keep doing it. And the more you do it, the more you'll get used to it, the more you'll understand how people perceive you and how people perceive your work. And I, I think the more you do it, the more you can, you can kind of sift through what's valuable and what's noise and what's people projecting their own bullshit on you and what is authentic and what, what matters and take everything in and then sift through it don't take things personally. Like it, your art is part of you, but it's not you. You're not gonna die if someone doesn't like your art. I go to shows all the time that aren't good, that I don't like, but I still learn from them, you know? So it's just doing it over and over again and knowing yourself and being confident and accepting when you're still figuring things out. And you know, this maybe I don't know what this thing is. And so I'm gonna present it just as an experiment to see what people think about it. Or I'm pretty sure I know what it is. And then someone's gonna say something that's gonna change your whole your whole um, outlook on it. So just to go with the flow, don't take it too seriously. You're not gonna die. And um, and yeah, remember that some feedback is very valuable and some feedback is not valuable at all. Thank you. <laughs> I like that, being able to sift through some of the noise and and what is what will be actually beneficial for you. Um, and hearing that out. David, do you have any additional thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to level with y'all. This is still something that I'm trying to figure out for myself. I think because I don't think we ever quite lose that gene of like just, you know, just tightening up a little bit when it comes to feedback, right? I think it shows that we care about our work, right? And that's important more than anything else is, you know, the fact that it stings even when someone doesn't like your work means you care about it. 
for me, and this is truly just for me, and all this is biased for me, so you can take it or leave it, the grocery store approach, right? Take what you need and leave the rest. But um, it really helped me to develop myself as a person, first and foremost, right? And what I mean by that is I had to really get a high sense of self-confidence and understand truly who I was first, right? To really make sure I built myself up as a human being first, because that way I was able to detach myself from the work that I put out as much as possible. Because ultimately you are not the work you do. You might have pride in the work that you do, but you as a person and individual worth do not have to be defined by whatever that you put out. And that is so much easier said than done. Like I said, I'm still trying to figure that out myself, but <clears throat> however avenue you decide to approach personal development, I suggest you lean in fully um, because truly I think the biggest gift that I have given myself in my professional career is becoming self-aware and self-confident enough to know, like Patrick is saying, when to accept feedback and when to just understand that it's not necessarily for me or something that has my best interests in mind, right? And so, yes, of course, like understand how to filter through, understand how to do those things, but also don't discount the element of personal growth that plays into a lot of the stuff, especially as creatives, because I think oftentimes we are so focused on the hard skills that we miss a lot of our own growth as well. And that can oftentimes dictate our success more than just simple skill development, in my opinion. So that's for me. Thank you so much, David, for that transparency. Um, Gabby, anything else? Yeah, that's really hard. Um, I, I agree, just kind of keep moving that even if you put something out there, it's not like the period at the end of your life, of your of your work, of your art. So it doesn't need to have that big of a um, pedestal or spotlight in your life. So I think setting those healthy boundaries is so important in anybody's work um, of what is that detachment? What, what level am I caring about it? Um, it's going to always have a part of you, but it's not you. You're not giving that up. So I think it's, you're going to figure it out as you go and you're going to have really some lows in it and you are going to take feedback not well or not understand. Mainly there's going to be a lot of miscommunication, <laughs> um, but I guess because you have, you know, a technique, a foundation laid out, I think just kind of trust that and that this is just you being curious and moving through and not stopping. Thank you. And this is going to be open to anyone and everyone. I appreciate everyone's transparency. How do you self-care then? How, you, you talk about the creatives, you know, you pour out a lot about who you are, you kind of showcase who you are. How do you self-care then? I'm just really curious. Anyone? I'll, I'll talk. Um, yeah, we art kids got to take care of ourselves. Um, I'm almost 40 and I'm still talking to my therapist about this. Um, those little bits of creative expression, um, Gabby, I can totally empathize with you about like, you put your work out there and it's like, this is a chunk of me. I remember being so frustrated in undergrad, um, talking to my friends who were like bio sci majors and they were trying to do their homework. And for them, it was like an assignment. And for me, it was a painting. I'm like, I'm not inspired. I don't want to do it. Like, I'm not feeling it right now. That was so much of my, like, I just can't, you know, like, I don't want to say like dance monkey, but like, I'm not ready to perform right now. I'm not like my, the creative part isn't working right now. Um, except that your brain works differently, expect, except that you're wired differently. Um, you're going to produce something amazing and beautiful that a lot of your peers can't do. Um, and if that means it comes in time or it comes after meditation, or if it comes after, you know, days of thinking about it, be okay with that. Um, for self-care, it means um, creating art that's just for you, um, whether that's dancing, a video, um, a bit of code, a little doodle, 
um, make something that's just for you. Make something that's not going out to the audience. Um, and that's huge for self-care and just um, alone time. Um, I know it's so hard to get, but even five or 10 minutes uh, just with yourself in your brain, um, away from work, away from your house, personal life, um, family, friends, that you can just kind of let your brain do its thing um, is great. But yeah, take care of those amazing, weird little brains of yours. Um, I'm still learning how to do that. And it's it's going to be so valuable and it's going to mean more pro productivity. And yeah, when I step away from work and I do a little sketch or even sometimes when I step away and I like do the wordle for the day, my brain is so much better ready to tackle a creative problem. So you really have take take care of your amazing brains, everyone. I I um don't don't take it for granted. Yeah, and I think boundaries and I think Joanna put that in the chat is really important because one thing that I've really learned a lot over the last couple of years is that no one is going to make you take a break but you. And especially as creative people, the industry is going to demand all it can get from you. And it's not going to reward you for taking a break, but it will punish you when your product suffers because you're burned out. Um, so you really have to watch, you have to figure out your like barometer for seeing when you're approaching that. For me, um, my creative thing that I love to do for just me is cooking because I love cooking and it's one of the only creative things that I can do that's not work related for me. I've never worked as a cook. I don't want to be a chef, but like if I'm reading a book, I'm like, oh, I should be writing. If I'm writing a watching a movie, I'm like, oh, I didn't finish that script that I had to send to the, pro but like cooking and, and my barometer for that is like, if I find that I'm like eating out every meal, it means that I'm too busy. Like, obviously I have not made time to take care of myself and also just putting vacation, like your vacation days in your calendar and committing to it. You know, I, I used to be such a workaholic and I was like chronically single and I was like all these things. And it's like, oh, well, you actually have to make time to like, to like have a relationship. What an, what an idea, you know, it's like all these different things that you really like. I thought that at some point in all of the mentorship and teaching that I got throughout my early career, that somebody would help me figure this out, but nobody, nobody would I had to do it myself because I kept getting rewarded for overextending myself and and uh, and overdoing it. So you really have to be your own advocate in that arena. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, definitely. I think that that spans through so many other careers and jobs. You have to be your own advocate, right? You have to take care of yourself. Um, thank you, Patrick. Oh, I had one more quick thing I wanted to add to that. This was a, something I learned too. If if you know someone or you see someone like in a public persona and you're like, how do they do it all? I'm trying to do it all and I'm not doing it. The secret is nobody is. And if they look like they are, they have assistants or they have rich parents or they have some other sort of funnel that's allowing them to do it. I've learned this time and time again. I'm like, how do they do it? Oh, they have four assistants and a trust fund. Okay, cool. I'm going to make myself dinner and shut the fuck up and calm down. So... Thank you. Oh, Gabby or David, do you have anything, anything to follow with that one? I don't know if I can follow that personally, but I think I just want to echo the idea of, of just understanding kind of what your, well, I guess what your triggers are and what your healing factors are, right? Um, oftentimes, I think we call it a self-care toolkit where if you can identify areas like Patrick is mentioning that where you're kind of getting burned out or you, you start to see yourself putting out less work, or even like Joanna said, if you're just not feeling it that day. Um, I am a very introspective person in case that wasn't already clear, but I like to look in and be, okay, so why, <clears throat> why is this happening, right? Ask myself, why am I feeling this certain way? And then you figure out if there's an avenue to, to, uh, to yeah, correct is too strong of a word, but to at least fill my, my cup up a little more, right? It looks different for everybody. It's going to look different for you. It's going to look different for each one of us, right? For me, it's, it's um, playing video games alone. It was a really, really great way for me to just disconnect from the world. It's a very escapist tendency, but it helps me, right? Even see, having a good conversation with a friend, um, oftentimes disconnecting from art entirely helps because you'll, you'll find inspiration in the weird, weirdest places I found, right? But 
I don't know if there's anything specific. It's just kind of the mindset behind it um, to, to make sure that you are aware of what's causing you to get down and taking out. Yeah, Gabby, do you have anything to add? Um, I was just, um, a lot of ideas came through my head as everyone's speaking. It, for me, it was really, really hard. I mean, going back to boundaries and finding your, what you value in your career is so important. And it was really hard for me to say bye to dance in the sense of I learned in a hard way that I cannot depend on dance, this thing that I love to be the financial backing. It could not, that connection of dance and my ability to pay my bills was actually not healthy for me. So I, you know, it was really hard to say bye to all the five jobs <laughs> in a way. <laughs> In, a, in another sense, I was so dead from it, like, just kind of like, I'm over it. Like, I'll go work for the man, like whatever. But it was, it's still hard that I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I dedicated my life, you know, for, you know, my, as a child, you know, you dance, you don't start late usually, especially me coming from ballet. So, but I, I realized like, wow, I, I worked in a really difficult working environment in a ballet company, go figure. And that was a lot. And I'm still, you know, kind of not okay with that. And it, it's been really, it's difficult to make those kind of choices. But I think, and everyone I can see here can make their are a reality, just maybe not in a way that they thought or feel like you're supposed to do things. And in fact, in my work, and I've worked with a lot of corporations and major like Fortune 500 companies, and they need artists. <laughs> like we, like there are artists there. I've worked with brilliant and continue to work with brilliant people, graphic designers, art directors, um, strategists. And it's so fun because as we get to know each other, everyone has a background that you would just never think, but it makes sense. And it's like, we need those people because in, in my work, you're dealing with stuff that's either people are way too formulaic, just boring, doing the same thing over and over again for everybody, right? It's just like, oh, that's the way we've always done it. I don't have time, just like do it that way. And then you have the other people who are like disorganized and super just reacting, oh, shiny object, you know, whatever. And like, you need that creative person to come in and just experiment again and take the research, take the foundational, take the reactionary and be proactive. And I, I really am just like, you know, I'm still for myself trying to make dance a personal practice. Um, but that's just, it's a hard thing to take care of yourself, right? But um, I think, you know, sometimes you just have to figure it out what that means to take care of yourself by going through those lows. Thank you all for sharing all of that. I, I really appreciate all of it. Um, it's so interesting how each of you have very similar yet very different ways of, you know, taking care of yourselves, but all of it, it's very intentional and that you have to be intentional about taking care of you and kind of separating yourself from what you love in the creative field, but you just still need to separate, do something completely different. And so um, thank you. I know there's a, a couple students still on here. If you have any questions, I did put it in the chat. Go ahead and place that in the chat if you have a question for any of the panelists. I'm happy to share that out and have them answer. Um, but as I, we wait for that. I want to see if you have any last minute insights that you want to leave students. What would you want them to think about as they head into a career in the creatives? What is something that you wish someone told you right before you graduated? 
And that could be anyone. I mean, I think I'm going to echo a lot of what I said before, so I apologize if I'm repeating myself. But um, the concept of, once again, you're not going to get good at something unless you do it a lot, um, is something that I knew but hadn't internalized yet um, coming out of college, right? And I had, I had mentioned this earlier, but I had completely written off a career in the creative field because I didn't have confidence. I didn't think I was good enough or would ever get good enough to be a professional in the creative field, which is why I stuck to student affairs. I stuck to what I knew. And I don't regret that, obviously, because it led to where I am now. But I wish I had someone that kind of just was like shaking me and be like, listen, like you, <laughs> like, of course, you're not going to be as good as what you see on Instagram or what you see on LinkedIn and things like that, because you just, you just don't have the experience yet. And even if they're at the same level as you, they've probably been doing it for longer than you or, you know, more consistently than you have been doing, right? The biggest thing that I've learned over the last, I guess, maybe three or four years, especially as my art career has really taken off, right, is that um, people's success in any field, let alone the creative field, <clears throat> is not some mystical thing that appears out of nowhere. And, and Patrick, you mentioned this, right, about people you see here, like they, they seem to have it all together and their lives are perfect and everything. And in reality, you just don't know, right? LinkedIn doesn't show the times you work the Taco Bell, right? LinkedIn doesn't show all those other opportunities that, you know, are just linger in the background, but are instrumental to people's lives. And if I had known to look at the people that I wanted to be like from a standpoint of I'm not like them, but I can be like them rather than I, I will never be like them. The growth mindset is such a big, big thing to adopt. Right. And so to the best of your ability, I know, again, this is easier said than done, but whatever you need, you need to do to get yourself in the headspace of not, you can be intimidated by artists. I still am. Right. But to not look at that as a, some impossible task to reach um, especially in the creative field. My gosh, there's so much potential for anybody in the creative field, right? Just if you want to be like somebody, then just, go, yeah, just work at it, work at it, work at it. I don't know how else to say it. Just um, it, it's something that happens intentionally over a long, likely period of time, right? And the more you commit to that journey, I think the more it's going to be easier on you when you still see that gap between you and them. Because you're going to see that and be like, but it's attainable, but I can cross that bridge, I can reach that, as opposed to just waving at them from afar, right? So that's the only thing I would say. I know that's kind of a repeat of what I said before, but I hope that helps. I would yeah. say like there's no one right way to go about things is, is really important and find out, identify you know, what's your way of like figuring stuff out? And for me, it's talking to people. So I really like just picking people's brands and just like just rambling my ideas or where I'm at, and what my questions are, and kind of trying to find my direction. And so I've done that starting with people around me. And then I would do it with like, kind of had like my own little personal committee of counselors in a way of professionals of people that maybe worked with or were mentors or whatever. And then I found something called um, adplist.org. Um, so I recently, like six months ago, quit a job, which I've quit a lot of jobs. So if anyone has any questions on job interviews or anything like that, uh, and I work in employer brand, so unfortunately I know too much, but it is a very difficult game. But ADP list is a great, uh, .org is a great site where it's free. Um, it's a mentorship program. So you can meet if you're especially a graphic design, it's mainly made for creators. Um, so you can um, schedule 30 minute calls with people who work at really big organizations like Google or Adobe, blah, 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 or even our entrepreneurs or just from all kinds of different backgrounds. And you can be a mentee or you can opt in as a mentor, you know, vice versa. And it's a really great way to network and speak to people like who you don't know, who are completely different. And for me, that was really helpful this last round of job hunting to speak with people who had maybe similar job roles as mine or worked at an organization that I was kind of like looking at or I just kind of wanted to hear somebody else's experience. So you can really use that 30 minutes to your value. And um, I, I just think 
for me, that was one thing I identified. I like talking to people. And then I also learned like, okay, I keep talking to the same people. <laughs> Let's try to diversify and talk to strangers. <laughs> Yeah, you guys are all way ahead of the curve by even just showing up today. I see Katie and Allison and Eva and Jada and Natalia. You guys are all on here learning. Um, so bravo to you, but reach out, um, look, use those networks, like find other ant eaters on LinkedIn or you know, through their career center and just chat with us. Oh my God, I wish I had someone to talk to. 15 years ago. Um, and there is art in everything. There is art. Uh, I remember being little, uh, you know, I tell the story and it feels kind of weird now, but um, I grew up in Northern California and my dad was really into wine country. And I remember one time him saying, you know, there's an artist that designs that label, like the wine label. And having that information, I was like, oh, there's art in everything. Um, knowing that, is huge. So don't be afraid to reach out um, and talk to other people. Yeah, just to echo what Gabby said, like everyone's been in your position and chatting with other people is the best, one of the best things you can do. And, and on the inverse of that, like art is in everything. And so is the back, the inventory and the taxes and the business of everything that's in everything too so it's really important for artists to build that part of their brain as well and I think the number one thing that I wish I'd been told more when I was younger was just um, to like know your own value because so much of the creative economy especially for younger people who are starting out is like come do this thing for free or come do this thing for free and and that that can be a good way to meet people but don't sell yourself short um Another thing that I've been thinking about a lot is just to be curious and to stay curious about what you're drawn to and like why and like don't get, I think we get jaded when we stop being curious and it's like, oh, I saw the show, it sucked, I don't like it. It's like, well, what, why did they make that choice? Why is it like that? Who's involved? Who do those people know? Who, if I was to get involved with this, like who would I want to talk to? Maybe I'll reach out to them. Like, like, like um, Joanna was just saying, like reach out to people um, don't be afraid. The worst that happens is someone reads your message and doesn't respond. It, but the best that could happen is that they're like, oh, come join me on this thing or come to, the, you know, you never know what opportunities are out there. So think about a world full of opportunities instead of the doors that are closing. Because if you think about doors that are closing, you're just going to end up shutting yourself in. So just think about creating connections and putting yourself out there. Thank you so much, everyone. I absolutely love this time that we had. Um, and so thank you. I just want to end with, you know, I learned a lot from all of you about, you know, finding that artistic identity. I, I think it was you, Gabby, that mentioned that, like finding that artistic identity in the community to surround you with that and to encourage you to really gain those soft skills because that's really what's going to propel you um, later on while those hard skills are going to be there and you're going to develop those. It's those soft skills. And a lot of that can be done during college, during student orgs, you know, time, time with people and um, developing that. And then a lot about intentionality. Everything is very intentional when you do this, whether it's self-care, whether it's building skills, whether it's just talking to people and meeting people and wishing somebody was there for you to talk to. Um, a lot of that is intentionality. And so I really thank you all for your insight and for all of you that are on this call. Um, if you have, I'm going to go ahead and stop today's recording. But again, I want to thank everyone. Thank you, David. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Patrick, for your time. I'm going to go ahead and stop this.